We're going to listen some music, but very little of it now. Let's do the beginning. Listen. Can you do it louder? The famous beginning of Tristan and Isolde by Wagner. These people are madly in love and it's a question you hear. You are expected to answer, but listen. There is no answer. There is another question on top of the first one. And this goes on and on and on and on for hours. Some people, of course, fall asleep. But you know, take the trouble to listen. Here's the third one. Take the trouble to listen and follow and give in to the music. You stand a good chance of becoming totally berserk and crazy. And that is what Wagner has in mind for you. Now, what is it that makes his mu music so exciting. And uh, it's something that we recognize in ourselves. It's the accumulative development that you hear in this music is also in our lives. And I have a little uh, metaphor to show you what I'm thinking about. It's a ratchet. <coughs> a ratchet is that little wheel, it's, it's well known in English, but we Dutch are not so accustomed to it. It's this wheel that can only turn to the left and not to the right. And in this case, it drives an elevator. And little man who just can drive this whole thing is standing on top there of the elevator. And he's going up and up. And he's very proud that he made this. But now he moves on and on and on and on and on. And then he finds out, oh my god. I can't get back anymore. So he disappears behind the clouds and we'll never see him again. And that is a ratchet, you see. And that is what Wagner has in mind to drive you crazy. We know it also from our own you know, life when we are born uh, as babies and we grow into adults. You know. This has the same kind of uh, accumulative growth, standing always on the top, on the shoulders of giants, as people say. And we know it from learning process. But I want to point to something much more fundamental than that. And that is this here. Yeah. You know this picture, very well known. It has changed our worldview. It's extremely crucial in our development of, of our society. This is for the first time that people could look uh, at the Earth from deep space together with the Moon. And now you see, you catch the difference. The Moon does not ratchet. It just, it's not dead, it's not alive, it just is. The most boring place you could ever imagine. But the Earth is ratcheting. And it has been doing so for four and a half, no, I should say 45 million centuries. That is a very, very long time. And it started simply as a ball of, of molten rock. But from there it changed all the time. And the ratcheting is about complexity. The Earth has become more and more differentiated and com complex ever since. And that is the difference, what you see here, and what moves us tremendously. We eventually came out of it. Now, people think, OK, that's biology. Biology, of course, is evolution. And evolution changes everything. And it, it evolves, it changes, so the Earth has changed as well. But it's more fundamental than that. It's already physics and chemistry that changed very early on, before there was any life around. For instance, this diversification, this, the, this differentiation between the core of the Earth and the mantle and the, and, and, and the crust on the outside is already 
physical. It's already a differentiation process and it went on very early before there was any life. And the differentiation between the continents and the oceans, that also is, is very ancient. And, and, and there was no life in the beginning, but life emerged in a very, very minor, small way. It must have. How? We don't know. But we have a hunch. And I try to explain what people now th do think sometimes about how this may have happened. In the deep, in the deep ocean, you get fountains of hot water coming out of the out of the out of the deep earth mounting up and they are carrying all kinds of very very complicated uh, and strange mix of chemicals and these start to react and they form these buildings that may go up sometimes 10 meters high big buildings that are porous and the water per percolates through it and there are very minor holes in there where all these chemicals begin to react and they become more and more complicated. And you see that uh, chemical complexity just increases tremendously in, 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 inside these little holes until a construct appears capable of making a copy of itself. So you begin with one and then you have two and then you have four and then you have 16 and you understand this is the beginning of life. Now, it spreads over the world, it differentiates tremendously, and uh, you get all these different organisms forming. And they're so complex, this is only the tip of the iceberg of one single cell. The reality is infinitely more complicated than this. And uh, so it gives you an impression of what goes on and what was necessary to construct life and to, to make it. This is one bacterial cell now. If you go on, you see what the first cell has produced. This is all of life. And where are we? There. At the, at the end of that, uh, of that arrow. And that's, if you look well, you take your hand lens, you can see it's animals. So all the animal life, millions of species, are there in that little, little bit of evolution. So the real thing it's astronomical. There's so many different species. Uh, you have the archaea and the bacteria. They are all bacter bacterial, in fact. And the other things are higher organisms, as they call them. I don't think they're very much higher. But uh, there is this tremendous diversity. And all these species carved out a particular niche on this planet. So the planet has differentiated beyond recognition. It's become totally... Uh, full of diversity. Now, it didn't do only that. It also changed the Earth. Life, together with all the other geological forces, such as volcanism and what have you, together changed the Earth completely. And this contributed immensely to the diversification of the Earth. And I'll give you just one example to show you what I mean. This is Isolde, you know, beautiful. And Isolde is strong and vigorous and beautiful, and she is, has plenty of oxygen, the elixir of life, and she's very happy, you see. Now, you wait for a few years, and you've seen it already, actually, what happens then is this girl. <laughs> My God, this is also Isolde. And it's also oxygen. Oxygen is, is not only the elixir of life, it also is a dreadful poison, one of the worst poisons that we know of. And it sits in that woman, and it sits in us, and it eats us away. We die, as a, we, our death is caused by oxygen. So, uh, oxygen is as we're living on the, on the balancing on the... Here, 21% of oxygen in the atmosphere. Compare that to 21% of nerve gas in the atmosphere. We can only survive because we're stuffed with mechanisms that take the oxygen away and detoxify the material. <coughs> so, and we are balancing as a result but on the border of the abyss all the time. We are fighting a struggle we don't even know we fight it. 
So that has increased tremendously to the diversity of the earth. How could that have come originated? Now, the next slide shows you what happened. This is 5,000 million years ago, just before the earth started, where the line becomes thick. And then you go on to the recent, and you see the oxygen mounting. But there was no oxygen right in the beginning at all. Life couldn't have originated in that con uh, under those conditions. So there was a world where there was life, but not so pleasant, you know. It's what we find in our bowels and our sm smelly Dutch ditches. It's this stuff. That is the early life. Bacteria, snot and slime. It's the backbone of the biosphere, and we still have it, and without that we wouldn't, we wouldn't live ourselves. But then, on about 2,400 uh, million years ago, that was the first oxygen appearing, and everything changes. So you got fresh air, and you got also uh, everything on the outer surface of the Earth oxygenating, like rusting away and everything was changed and also gave a tremendous boost to evolution. And then it went up again and up again, and then in the very end, you see that we're going back to square one again. Not for long, I hope, but that is, again, a stenchy world. Okay. This is about the last, the last step. It's us. Animals have organs on them as you can see, on which they totally depend for their survival. And we also have organs. We are like that, but we have something in addition. We have exterior or or, uh, organs, like these here. And these organs are, we are actually, I should say, animals with exchangeable organs. We can exchange our organs without suffering. So we do that, and we we change all the time, and we evolve these organs, and we get cities and, and complicated things beyond recognition again. So what we do for the Earth is speed up the wretched again. This is the last step of speeding up the wretched of the Earth. You should see it from the Earth perspective. When we looked at the Earth for the first time from deep space, it was the Earth looking at herself for the first time in 45 million centuries, through our eyes. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. We are yeah. on this earth now. And yeah. I refer back to the music of Wagner. It was devised. It was uh, designed by Wagner. So many people think that this also was designed. This is a result of design. Well, I think it's a stupid idea. And I'll tell you why. It's just the same as saying that an ant's nest has a board of directors. This earth is free, you see. It moves along. We're part of it. And it, we don't know where it goes. So, one difference with the Wagner Opera is that the earth is a very messy place. It's full of horror, and it's only when you look at the very long geological time scale, that the wretched becomes apparent. When you are in the mess yourself, and when you are in trouble, don't forget, and I hope that you won't, don't forget to think, and to realize, oh my God, I am at home in this miraculous, bittersweet planet. Thank you very much.